Welcome everybody again to, to the TU Delft uh, University of Buenos Aires uh, online courses, especially of the Board Engineering Postgraduate School of the University of Buenos Aires with TU Delft. This week we are with the Coastal Structure Team of uh, TU Delft uh, with Bas Hofland and Alessandro Antonini. Uh, this is the second day. And well, then Bas and Alessandro will will elaborate about the details, but it's basically related with modeling tools, uh, the topics that uh, we will be dealing today. Uh, again, it will be structured in some in two blocks. Uh, questions can be uh, on the chat, can be written on the chat during the, the whole session. And then uh, after the, the first part and before the break, we can do a session of questions uh, like yesterday. And then at the end of the of both lectures, we we can keep going with, with further discussion. Uh, so uh, this is the the overall introduction. Welcome everybody, and hope you enjoy it. So Bas, all yours. Okay, thanks uh, thanks Pablo for the introduction, and thanks uh, Pablo and Raúl and Sebastian for inviting us to give this. Uh, these lectures, and it's always nice to talk about the things that you like. And uh, what I like, what my hobby is, is, is physical modeling. Uh, and it's, it is also still the most important tool to design coastal structures or to actually to verify them. So um, uh, it is something uh, nice to share. Uh, some people uh, will say that, well, I, I said it myself, that we now are talking about the old fashioned methods, the, 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 the lab work and this afternoon, or this uh, the second hour, sorry still morning for you. Alessandro will be talking about the more modern uh, approaches, although they take uh, way too long and a, and a physical model actually gives you your answer at this moment, still much quicker, uh, typically. Um, but we'll go uh, come around to that. So um, yeah, I put all our logos here. And uh, although I'm now working at TU Delft, um, a lot of the content here is, this is an old presentation I adapted is from Deltaris. So uh, the old Delft Hydraulics Institute, um, so that's why I credit them here uh, for giving also us a lot of nice uh, pictures of these model tests of coastal structures. So maybe uh, a little bit about myself. So why am I talking about uh, physical modeling? Uh, and actually I've been doing physical modeling my entire professional career, starting with a PhD uh, here in TU Delft, then 11 years as a coastal structures uh, advisor uh, at Deltaris. Uh, and the main tool they're using uh, is physical modeling. And presently, I'm associate professor in coastal structures here at TU Delft again, now for six years. Uh, and I'm also head of the hydraulic laboratory we have here. So uh, I'm still very much involved in this modeling. Uh, some projects I worked on uh, at Deltaris were uh, a, a project to make very large wave impacts. Uh, so uh, with, um, uh, with a wall of 10 meters high and waves of three and a half meters. Uh, uh, hitting the wall as hard as possible using this gigantic wave in the Delta film. That was a real nice project. Uh, I was busy with the design and uh, the assessment of the design of the mass lock, the, the second mass lock, the port extension, but I will be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, I was also involved in making this Delta flume, uh, which is the largest wave flume in the world, which is a nice uh, uh, piece of um, research equipment. Uh, and at TU Delft, we are also doing, uh, of course, I'm now also doing research one thing is about the hydraulic structures and the wave impacts on that uh, in the Afsluit Dijk. Uh, and that is something uh, I will uh, talk about in the keynote lecture on this, this research project uh, in two weeks. Uh, and another project uh, also that well, I will show shortly here is about wave damping uh, by woody vegetation. Like building with nature is very uh, popular. So there are some places in the Netherlands um, and of course also with mangroves um, where we want to use uh, big forests of trees that are already in front of a dike uh, to already attenuate the wave height a little bit. So we're looking at the physics of this problem. Uh, how do these, uh, how can we um, assess wave um, uh, damping? And also something that we can use physical modeling for. So there are some of the things that I do and I will show. So what will this talk be about? Um, well, first the introduction, I'm already busy with that. Uh, then I, well, uh, probably this is well known for you, but as I structured this, this I took my uh, normal course on, on physical modeling from uh, that I give all the students. Uh, so I will briefly recap scaling laws uh, and then uh, 
look at uh, the, the things where we still have some problems. Um, and then the main part of this, uh, this, this um, so that is the, the general concepts that we, uh, uh, of course, need to make model tests, which typically are at smaller scale than its reality. Uh, and then I will do uh, uh, um, per mechanism that we want to study, uh, per aspect of a coastal structure that is important. Uh, I will show some recent tests that we did in the laboratory here in the university or at Deltaris, uh, some, some examples and some uh, problems that we encountered. Uh, and then the last bit is about wave generation. Because we don't only need to measure uh, and model everything. We, the main uh, hydraulic attack, of course, are wave heights, uh, and uh, we need to generate them. And we've been doing that for quite a while. So here we can see a nice picture. So this is of the old laboratory of um, Deltaires, or then Delta Hydraulics. So they started out in the polder in the north of the country, uh, and they had, they had these very big open air facilities. And here you can see that they made an entire harbor. Uh, so here we can see the port layout and the wave penetration into the port was modeled with nice regular waves that was made here. And if you're ever in Holland, uh, you should visit this Waterloop Bos. It is still in North Oostpolder, and this this model now with the rusty wave makers, you can still visit it. And now it's a very nice nature reserve to walk around in. So. That's a, a tip if you go there. Uh, so why do we need physical modeling? Well, we, all these coastal structures that we make, like this uh, very huge uh, breakwater in La Coruña that uh, uh, was built in the north of Spain. Uh, had, there's many designs that we want to optimize. All the empirical formulas uh, are still uh, quite uh, crude. So just, just to, and all the circumstances are really site specific. Every wave is different everywhere. So we uh, need to just verify the designs that we want to make. Uh, and because we want typically, de uh, we design our structure for um, uh, a storm that doesn't happen every day. Uh, it happens only where every 100 years or even fewer. We can wait a long time to study these waves uh, in real scale. So it's better to make uh, it at a small scale in a laboratory flume. And we just turn the button and we have this once in 5,000 year storm immediately in our basin. Uh, it is also a nice tool to identify single processes. So not only the, the more applied approach but that we would have like in Deltares, where we really have this breakwater at that location that we study. Uh, but if I just want to know about overtopping in general, for instance, then it's more the terrain of a um, university. And we really go into the in, uh, in depth in small scale studies of processes that can later on, um, well, then we go to the next point, for instance, help make uh, numerical models where we need to have uh, processes in there to, to model also the whole wave system and the flows. Uh, and of course, these wave models, once we have made them, we also want to check them. Uh, so uh, it is not that uh, numerical models are uh, actually uh, uh, making the demand for physical models less, but because all the numerical models are made, actually we get more of the demand because we also have to validate the numerical models at the moment. Uh, and then there is sometimes that's a nice field of work that I like the, the sound of is forensic investigation. Sometimes a big structure fails um, and we want to um, determine why this fails. So um, uh, a, a specific class of tests are just to mimic a broken structure and to find out why this, this structure didn't, uh, didn't work. Uh, so, and some of the, the processes that we are studying are, are the damage to uh, structures like this, overtopping or transmission of the waves, forces uh, on all kinds of uh, elements in our structure. Uh, sometimes the mooring of ships in the, in, the, in the port, although that is more and more done numerically. Uh, and also we try to model the scour of fine sediments, although that, is, that poses a, uh, a problem sometimes. So, and typically we want to, study everything at small scale because it's just way cheaper and easier to observe. Uh, but things must not be too small because uh, we want to have high Reynolds numbers. Uh, sometimes we want to have a good representation of material properties. Um, uh, we want to have undistorted scale. So we cannot have a length scale and a width scale that is, that is, uh, that is different. It's only a very, very few cases that we do that uh, anymore. Only in like big river models in the old days, we had these distorted scales, but typically we really want to have a, a good representation of our structure, like the, the breakwater slope that we can see here in the picture with a nice uh, single layer armor unit on it. Uh, and also we have surface tension. So if we go too small, then the surface tension alters our uh, behavior of our waves. And we are, the typical thing that we want to test for coastal structures are waves. Sometimes we add some flow. 
we can look at problems in 2D in a flume or 3D in a basin. Uh, and often you do both. And then another, another thing is small scale and large scale. Uh, for instance, uh, some problems are first studied in small scale and then later on the final validation of a few cases are done at large scale because it's very, uh, it's typically very expensive. So you don't want to do too much tests like that. And of course we can have a fixed bed. Typically we use a fixed bed for the structures, but sometimes we also use at this uh, the movable bed, for instance, to look at scour. So, um, so I already talked about this. So what do we need? So we need flumes if we want to test trunk section of a breakwater or a basin if we want to look at the round heads or oblique waves or short crested waves. Um, and well, typically we want to go to small scale uh, and sometimes, yeah, we want to go to full scale. And especially in the Netherlands, we have this um, Delta flume and uh, there we test mainly dikes because dikes are made of clay and grass and, and materials that actually are impossible to make smaller. So then the, the material properties just change. So sometimes we're just forced to, to build these dikes at full scale and, and test them. And that's the only way to really with some certainty say uh, something about their strength. And of course, you, sometimes you need waves and sometimes you need currents. So on the right, I put some examples, the wave basin at Daltaris. Here you can see the, the large uh, delta flume where they're testing this. Uh, this is actually the old one. There's now a new one here in Delft, and that's uh, even a little bit deeper. Uh, and here they're testing the, the second mass flux. So this is what I will present tomorrow. Uh, sometimes you want a combination of the waves and currents. And I didn't only want to show things out from Delft, but of course there's many um, laboratories around the world. And also in Wallingford in the United Kingdom, they have a very large uh, modeling facilities. Uh, where you can make uh, waves and, for instance, test this gigantic uh, revetment or breakboard. So, but to specify uh, what we have in Delft, because these are the things that we are working with uh, mostly. And uh, uh, so first, uh, 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 where we are working, the TU Delft, we have our own hydraulic engineering laboratory. You can see a picture on the top right here. Uh, so actually we have only one really good wave flume with the uh, state-of-the-art wave maker. We're in the process of, that is the one here in front, we're in the process of upgrading the second one to also have a state-of-the-art uh, art, uh, wave maker because we see that the, the wave flumes are typically fully booked. There's a lot of demand on that. Uh, another thing that we are actually quite um, uh, growing in is in field measurements. There's a lot of people, especially when you look at, at morphology, uh, that's difficult to scale down at small scale, so why not go to the field? So at the moment, the, the, the field measurement team, they have a quad, a jet ski and a boat, and they put all kinds of sediment sensors, ADCPs on it, and uh, like the Zend engine, but also other newer measures and the marker, rather all kinds of projects are being uh, measured by them. But this is not my specialty, so that is for a different topic, a, a different talk, maybe uh, next time. And it's also maybe less related to ports, which typically still have the hard defenses, otherwise the, bo the boats do not fit into the, the harbor, of course. Um, and for the rest, we have a lot of other uh, flow flumes uh, in this uh, laboratory, uh, and we really want to have good measurement techniques to unravel these fine processes. Uh, then, of course, one kilometer from here, we have the Institute of uh, Deltares, formerly Delta Hydraulics. And as I said, they have this delta flume, which is about 300 meters long, five meters wide, and nine and a half meters deep. And that's really a gigantic thing, so it's really nice to do tests in there. You can see here a picture, this is me. Uh, there's a dike slope being tested here, and on the other side you can see the little blue uh, wall of 10 meters, that is the wave pedal that has a stroke of 7 meters to make waves up to 4.5 meters high, so the single waves, so the significant wave height up to 2 meters. So that's really, uh, uh, really impressive to work with that, so uh, if you're in Delft, try to, try to visit it when there is a project, because uh, it's really a storm that you can make there. And also all the other... Um, uh, Flumes and basins, they have the tires are a little bit bigger to have less scale effects. Uh, and they really uh, are used to have certain uh, site specific problems and to really tackle engineering problems for a certain uh, site. Uh, and we work, of course, closely together with helping each other with instrumentation and personnel. And that is also optimizing both laboratories. So, of course, we need to make all these uh, waves, especially in our, our basins. But we, yeah, when we make them, we also need to measure all kinds of things. And here you can see some more of the traditional measurements. So with velocities by an electromagnetic probe, wave heights with resistance gauge, 
or the bathymetry of a structure. Actually, again, this is the second mass flux. And these are these profilers just that just uh, touch the, the structure and see how the height changes due to wave attack. Uh, so these are the more classical uh, approaches. Uh, and these days, actually, we're doing more and more with aspects like, like imaging, video, and photography. It, it's all digital, so that, that helps a lot. Uh, also, uh, the velocity can be done with PIV techniques. So I will show some uh, examples of that later, of what we recently did. So then uh, scaling. So that was the introduction. So we want to uh, model all these uh, things uh, at small scale. And typically, we have a scale factor, uh, which is the value of something in reality divided by something uh, in, the, uh, in the model. So if I have a 40 meter uh, high uh, deep uh, sea and I will make it one meter in my model, then the scale, uh, the geometric scale, the length scale is 40 by uh, divided by one is 40. And the geometric scale of all the length sizes uh, is typically uh, uh, called the scale. Uh, and then the scale of other parameters that, 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 that are you know, different from a length, they are called uh, uh, you know, like they are. Um, and how to go to the, for instance, the time scale or the force scale. Uh, in principle, we want to represent dimensionless numbers well. And then this dimensionless, so the scale for the dimensionless number, which is a capital pi here, should be one. Um, and then this, is, this scaling is typically not possible for all dimensionless number. And each dimensionless number typically represents one process that we want to uh, model. Uh, and if so, if a uh, certain uh, number is not represented at the scale one, then this process is not scaled well. And that's what we call a scale effect. So we need to select the numbers that we represent, and then we have to evaluate what happens to all the other processes. And that is the trick of scaling. So here is a list of all these dimensionless numbers that we have, and it's by far not the complete list. So there's many things that we want to uh, look at. Most important are the fruit number and the Reynolds number. So we want to have a good free surface de deformation, which is quite important if you have waves. Um, so that's the basic scaling number. The Reynolds number, we want to have large enough such that we have turbulent flow. And there's a whole bunch of other uh, dimensions numbers that we will come by later on automatically. So what is the fruit number? Well, that says something about inertial stresses. Uh, so uh, inertia compared to gravity. And if we work that out, we come to u over square root gh. So if we represent this well, then the waves have the similar behavior in the model as in the prototype. And then the Reynolds number says something about, again, inertia compared to viscous stresses, so the viscosity in the fluid. And typically, that, uh, see, uh, that tells us if our flow is turbulent or not. And uh, well, actually, it is a coincidence if our Reynolds number is high enough, so not represented perfectly, but high enough, then also our uh, fruit scaling um, uh, works on, on forces. So that's why uh, we want to represent the fruit number, but the Reynolds number should just be high enough. So, uh, and then this uh, using the scaling, we can, for instance, make this, this breakwater. I think it was in Badalona. And we can see here all these things that we want to know about our coastal structures. So of course we want to know the waves that are coming in. We want to have the stability of all these rock, uh, rock, these blocks and these rocks here in the tow structure. The transmission sometimes, not in this one actually, that is how much wave, waves, wave energy is passing or the overtopping flow that's connected, collected in this bin here. Uh, and sometimes we want to know flow velocities. And here, this section in the middle of this uh, stepped uh, uh, crest wall here, there are pressure sensors in there. So you can also, uh, go uh, and measure the forces on these concrete structures for which the structural engineers typically they want a force to, uh, to design their concrete with. So for wave behavior, so as I said, we need fruit scaling, uh, but also we want to have uh, so not an effect of surface tension with which will, uh, it's for small waves, you get capillary waves, which have a completely different dispersion relation. So uh, if we work that out, we want to have wavelengths at least larger than 20 centimeters. So actually, this is not a, a scale that we typically have. Typically, we, want, we have quickly bigger uh, length scales in our waves. So uh, we can neglect surface tension often and also viscous effects. So uh, we want to have high Reynolds numbers because um, uh, so actually the flow in a wave is not turbulent. So here the Reynolds number does not say anything about turbulence but it says something about damping. So in a real scale wave of two meters, if it travels for hundreds of kilometers, it will 
not decrease in height. It is rather constant. But um, if we are going to a too small a scale, then the viscosity in the fluid will dampen the waves and we will lose 10 or 20 percent of our wave height uh, when it's going through the through the channel. So, uh, but also that is not a very big demand because for that the, the wave height in our models should be larger than one centimeter. And then, uh, then it works. Uh, so we use this fruit scaling for these waves. Uh, and we, so we say that our fruit number, the scale must be one. And if you work that out, then you can in the end fill in all the scales of all the different parameters in the fruit scale. And that scale should be one. And we come to the final conclusion that the scale of our velocity, because that is here in our fruit, should scale, uh, should be uh, balanced by the square root of the h. So the square root of the velocity is the same as the square root of the depth, which is a length scale. So it's the square root of the length scale. So that means that our velocity scales with the square root of the, uh, uh, the geometric scale. Uh, and because time is a length divided by a velocity, then we can also say that a length scale divided by the square root of a length scale, again, is the length, the square root of a length scale. So also our time scales with the square root of the length scale. So this is how the fruit scaling works. Uh, and we can come to a velocity scale directly from the fruit number. But if we fill it in in other formulas, you can also work out the length scale, uh, the time scale. And then you can also uh, get a scale for frequencies, velocities, accelerations, discharges, pressures, and forces. So this is uh, how we uh, can measure something at a, at, a, at a flume of 50 centimeter depth and say something about our, our sea level of 32 meters depth. The only thing that we see here is if we look at pressures and forces, then we also need to include the density of the fluid. And that actually comes from Euler scaling, but that is... Uh, 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 it, it's typically called fruit scaling uh, at the end as well. So in principle, the whole in the whole uh, 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 how do you say the whole uh, fruit scaling of fluids, the density is not in there. So we could, for instance, take a whole basin of alcohol, and the, still the scaling of the of the waves will be the same. Uh, only if we look at the forces in this alcohol, then the scaling would be different. But for the rest, it's. Of course, not very wise to have a big basin full of alcohol in uh, light of uh, flammability. Okay, but that's something different. So, and here a nice uh, movie of this is also a wave, of course. Uh, this is a wave hitting an inclined wall, uh, filmed at a, a thousand frames per second. Uh, and here we can see that if the wave, let me try to start it again. Oh, it doesn't want to start it again. So, let's keep it like this. But you see when the wave is almost hitting the wall, though, yeah, here we, we see it. So here, this crest is really um, very, you can see all kinds of instabilities. The drops are going up. And this all leads to a lot of variability in this force. So if we repeat this wave 10 times, we can have about 100% difference in the maximum and uh, in the oh, well, 100, but at least very huge differences in, in the exact um, force. And that comes to the, all these very small drops and instabilities. There's a lot of papers on this you know, to, to, to find the origin of all these instabilities. Uh, it's also not your wave pedal. It can be very stable, but still you get uh, just by turbulence and all kinds of chaotic behavior, you can see these differences. But we can also see there's a lot of scale effects. So this, this, this exact tip of the, of, the, of the wave and all the drops, of course, they are influenced by scale effects. So even this wave that is coming, it's, it's way larger than a one centimeter. So there is no scale effect in the wave uh, uh, propagation, but the details of this impact, of course, if, if you look closely enough, you will find scale effects. And that's called by the, the Weber number that is not scaled correctly. And that means that the surface tension becomes more influential on the small scale than on the large scale. Uh, and so that is, uh, for instance, uh, a certain wave that will have a foamy uh, top in reality might have uh, just a smooth curve uh, in, uh, in small scale. <laughs> From uh, maybe somebody, or was there a question? No, oh, no. Okay, next one. Okay, then we also want to measure our waves. Uh, so um, uh, let me see where I am. Uh, typically, we did we we use uh, several wave gauges to determine our incoming wave. It can be two, three, or more gauges, and there's all kinds of methods for that to to determine this incoming wave. 
Uh, actually, I, I, we also wrote a paper on uh, the positions of these gauges because that's a bit unclear. What is the optimum position of these gauges to, to measure as wide a spectrum as possible? So there is a list with references in the end. Uh, but actually, uh, if these, these are these many uh, um, approaches to measure the incoming waves are all based on linear wave theory. So if we go to very shallow water depths uh, or breaking waves, uh, then actually all these theories do not work, whether it's with two, three or four gauges. Um, so typically, uh, the best thing to measure your incoming wave is to just remove the structure that we're testing, damp the waves at the downstream sides very well. And so then the total wave height that we measure actually is the incoming wave height because there's just no waves coming back. And after doing this, this, this test of the waves, we um, do the test again. So repeating the test without a structure for the cases where these normal uh, methods like uh, Mansard and Funke do not work to measure our incoming waves is actually to do the test twice and once without the structure. Um, so then we go to the stability. Here we can see a very nice revetment that was tested in Neltares. This is uh, one of the, the pro rock protections of Dubai where they made all these uh, big, uh, big islands uh, because they wanted to have low crests. They did these very huge berms of about 25 meters wide. Uh, and to, to, to um, uh, scale the stability of these rocks, we want to keep the uh, stability number the same. So this is the number that we know from the Hudson formula, wave height over delta D. And that should also be same in prototype and in model. And we worked it out, then you will see that the density, the, the diameter scale, so the diameter of the rock should just scale exactly as the length scale. That is what you would expect because the length and the uh, diameter, the diameter is also a length. But we do have also a density scale because forces are involved. And then you see that this delta is the submerged um, uh, um, relative uh, density. And for instance, the water in our models typically is fresh and in the sea it is uh, salt. So there's a little bit more buoyancy in salt water. And that's why we need to do in the uh, use in the fresh water, a little smaller rock to have the correct weight uh, for the stability of these rocks. And the rocks is, are so um, uh, irregularly shaped that you don't see 5% difference in the, in the diameter. Um, of course, if we make these nice blocks, uh, the, the, the acropods or X blocks to, for, on our slope of our breakwater, then we can just alter the, the, uh, the density such that uh, we just can make the exact length scale of our, uh, of our uh, blocks. And then what is the scale of our, um, that we need to have the, a stable rock slope? Uh, and typically, this graph is used. This was uh, made in 1969, again, in a large flume and a small flume in, uh, um, in the UN United States, at the same time as Hudson. Uh, and we can see here the stability number again. So this is all tests on the same structure. And here we can see the Reynolds number. And in this case, that is defined uh, like that. So with a wave height, a diameter, and a kinematic viscosity. And this line gives the uh, critical value for the stability number. So when we got failure um, on this structure, and the structure was all time the same, but the scale changed. So when we go to a smaller scale, we go from this stability number to that stability number, and that is what you expect. Huh? So you get the same result when you go to a smaller scale. But if you go even smaller, then suddenly the critical uh, 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 stability number goes down. So we get more damage. So from this, it is said that the Reynolds number, so this Reynolds number should be larger than 10,000, uh, or sorry, 40,000 to have a good scaled model. Uh, and that is true. So typically you want to have armor units larger than uh, four centimeters. But this scaling law has been made with a breakwater with a porous core. So actually the scale that we see here is the scale of the flow through the core. So that becomes at a certain time laminar. And then we know from the Van der Meer equations, if, if we have more resistance in the core, then we get more damage. So actually, when we would look at scaling for an impermeable core, so a dike, for instance, then actually I'm quite convinced that you could go with, uh, with rocks of one, one, one centimeter. So you can you make your, your rock smaller because the flow around your rock, it is turbulent also for flows uh, uh, around a one centimeter uh, rock. So, um, but actually this has never been proven. So this is still a, a research I'm waiting for students to, to do that for me. Um, by the way, I see a question, and I can I think you can answer why not use uh, fresh water, seawater instead of fresh water, which is a very good question, um, and that could help, of course, but uh, it just makes all our flumes uh, rust. 
So it is just very impractical and expensive to use uh, seawater. Uh, but it is a very, if you want to make a, a stainless steel flume and can pay for it and, and have this whole apparatus to make the salt water, then it is a, it is technically a very sound solution. But it typically it's easier to, to change the density of the modeling units because then also we have the correct, uh, exactly the correct length scale and the correct um, uh, uh, density scale. Okay, so back to the scaling. So this was about the exact uh, limit of scaling. So actually this, this limit of scaling that is determined here is only for uh, damage. So not for another response, for instance, for overtopping, it might be different. And it's also for a structure with a porous core. And this is always forgotten if people uh, want, for instance, you want to have a model test for your, uh, for your dike and you prescribe this scale, then you pay for an expensive model test and it might have been cheaper because you could have done it under a smaller scale. Uh, sometimes uh, this core scaling, so if we have this influence of this flow through the core, people try to correct for it. There is a, a approach by Burghardt that's used, and then the flow, the resistance of the flow inside a porous core, it is modeled by the um, Forheimer equation that we see here, and then the, this uh, hydraulic gradient should be the same in the model and the prototype. But actually, this is actually also, if you read the original paper, it has not been proven. So it is a trick to sort of scale a uh, hydraulic gradient but the hydraulic gradient yeah, because it's it changes everywhere in the structure we have a different hydraulic gradient and also in time it changes so you need to get some characteristic value that you want to scale but you already see that it can never be an exact scaling so it is a little trick so better just to use this this size of four centimeter then and then we don't have this this uh, entire uh, problem of core scaling another thing that we often see with um, uh, damage to uh, rock protection, rock structures, is that the, every time we repeat the test, we have a lot of variability. A part of the variability can be due to the waves, that every time, uh, of course, you can have a different wave um, signal, but with the thousand waves, that typically averages out quite well. And often, of course, we can repeat in a model test with exactly the same wave record, so then this variability is out. And still, we, this, we see the results that we see here. And that is just because yeah, rocks, they are randomly placed. So it's actually a very chaotic or uh, probabilistic um, uh, scattered system because, and especially if you look at low damage numbers, then for instance, a normal width of a flume is 20 units wide. So we have 20 stones in our width. And then we can see for 80% uh, of the design wave height. So that is low damage numbers. Then we can see that um, the standard, sorry, you should look on the right, but then the standard deviation here on the right, for 80% of the design wave height, it's about 40% of the mean value. So this S value that we measure can be, well, this is standard deviation. So it can be 80% uh, lower, lower or 80% larger. So that is really huge variability in the damage numbers. Uh, and the typically, uh, as, um, uh, the width that is typically in the old manuals prescribed is 20 uh, stones. But if you look at results like this, we don't want a bias in our error in our measurement, and we also don't want a very large standard deviation. So actually for the design wave as well, you would at least want 50 stones or 100 stones, or just repeat your test a few times to average the results, or just take into account that this answer, it's not very, um, it's not very certain. Yeah? So uh, just this is very important to take into account. Another thing is the definition of damage. Because we all know the Van der Meer formula that says we want to use the S value. So that is actually this. Uh, this so if this is a cross section of our structure, then we can uh, average the cross section over the width and we get this uh, average erosion. Uh, so after a test, this is the, the profile right at the beginning of this. And then this S value is based on this, this um, erosion area. And it looks very nice and, and there are standards for that and it's very well. And then we go to a real test. And nowadays, with uh, photogrammetry, so with, 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 with a lot of pictures or with a laser scanner, we can make these very cool plots where we can see the real damage to this breakwater. So this was a test that we did in Porto. So here you can see the, the 3D representation of breakwater and the colors, they say the erosion after the test. So you can see red, there is a lot of uh, stones uh, moved and on uh, the blue, that's where the stones end up. And so they roll down, let's go here. So then this, at this stretch, we can average the width and we know what a sort of the, that S value is. But you could also say, well, here is, if I average over this width, I have a low S value and here I have much more damage. So actually this, this averaging width really 
uh, also just gives you, you can select the answer that you want to have. And you can also see in this round head, next to the round head by diffraction, we have a lot more damage than, uh, than further on. And also around here. So how to average this area to get an S value? Nobody knows. So we have this nice S value that, um, that should give you a, a state. Uh, this limited damage is an S of two, intermediate damage is S of five. But here we cannot determine S because we don't know how to average. Uh, and also the S value is different. Huh? So for a one in three slope, we designed for a different value than the one in two slope. Well, so actually what is the, the most logical thing to look at here is actually the depth. So the erosion depth that is equal everywhere. It doesn't depend on the slope or where we are on the, uh, on the round head. So uh, I'm really much in favor of describing the, the allowed damage to this round head uh, in terms of depth of erosion and not this area. And then we will have a much more versatile uh, damage number that can also be used for all. Uh, so you can specify before you know your design, you can specify what damage you want. So you say an erosion depth of 0 0.3 diameters. Uh, and then the engineer can design any structure for any slope. So that is uh, a little thing about uh, rock damage. And I see that I'm taking way too much time. So I'm hurrying up a little bit. Um, so. Ah, I see here a question. So let's, let's go back to the, it was on this. Uh, it was how many times should the experiment repeated to make sure the results are robust? So in the end, we want to know how many diameters in width we have tested. So for instance, I want to have from these graphs, you can see, for instance, I want to have 100 diameters in width to have a, um, so if I have my test set up with 20 uh, stones, then I have to repeat it five times because then I have in total tested a, a width of 100 stones. And then I come to these, uh, well, and here it's a bit more to the right. Then, then you come to these numbers of, of uh, error that you expect. And so if you have a little bit smaller stones, you have 50 over the width, then you can do it with twice testing. So that is uh, how you could uh, look at it. And a repeating test is just getting more samples. So actually uh, you, you with every repetition, you add another width of your, uh, uh, of, of your test section. So then we go to overtopping. So that uh, here we see a nice um, a breakwater I tested in Madeira. So there was this original one with way too much overtopping and they want to have a second breakwater in front of it. And then here there is this overtopping bin with which we collect this, this overtopping water. Uh, and then of course, volume divided by the length over which it's overtopped and the duration gives you our, uh, the overtopping discharge. And that we can also scale with fruit scaling. I'm skipping the nice um, movie, but there is our links in the thing I will share. Uh, so, but here we see a, uh, especially for a very high crest, so with a, a little overtopping, and typically we want to have safe structures with not too much overtopping. So then we can see here the height of the wave um, bin, of the bin where we collect all this overtopping water. And we can sometimes a wave is coming over and, and it adds to the total volume. And this total volume at the end divided by the duration is, of course, the overtopping discharge. But then we see if this whole overtopping discharge is only, um, is in this case, this three waves that, that, that make most of the overtopping. So yeah, we can have one wave extra or less. So that's already um, easily 30% inaccuracy. So you see that for, in this paper, um, uh, for very uh, high crests, so for very low overtopping discharge, you can have inaccuracies of, well, this is the, the plus or five. Uh, so this is about two standard deviations. This is logarithmic scales. So here you can see the, that there is a factor of 100 on an uncertainty or so. So there's also huge uncertainties that we have here. So the main thing is that what you want is to have enough overtopping. So if you have a low chance of occurrence of overtopping, you just need to go and measure way longer. So where the standard test is always a thousand waves, that's actually only based on making a good spectrum of the incoming waves. Now we have to look at the process of overtopping waves and we just actually need, let's say uh, 20 or 30 overtopping waves at least to have a good um, mean value of this overtopping. So if you just have a low number of overtopping waves, we should go to 10,000 waves or 20,000 waves if you want to know it accurately. And otherwise, uh, yeah, you, 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 uh, uh, you just need to accept that you have this very large uncertainty of a factor 100. Uh, so really the, look critically at these thousand waves because uh, there are cases that you do not need them and there are cases that you need 10 times more. And of course, 
uh, that is the wave uncertainty, but also for overtopping, if you have overtopping over a rock structure, then the rock placement can also influence that quite a lot. So then you have the same story to rebuild it, your structure a few times to look at the aspect uh, of that. Okay, that was the overtopping. That went quicker. That's nice. Um, now there is trans transmission. So that's nice. So here you see some uh, the last two years in our flume. So this is a brushwood structure. They're using that in Indonesia and Vietnam to protect mangroves from uh, so that mangroves can regrow. Uh, and they are made from brushwood horizontally in, in a frame. Uh, and we can already see that, uh, so this was a very nice experiment that were done, but these are very small, uh, uh, I think half a, half a centimeter big. So actually we know there is viscous forces here. This is not scaling correctly. Uh, but what we could do, we could estimate the, what is the uh, uh, hydraulic resistance of this uh, uh, material just by letting water flow through. Uh, so we could put this resistance in the numerical model. So even though this does not scale well to full scale, so in the paper of Dow, I have referred to it later, we just used the actual uh, occurring uh, 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 hydraulic uh, resistance of this uh, uh, structure to validate the numerical model. And then we plugged in at the larger scale, just for the regular flow, we, we, we had the real uh, resistance and we could, uh, sorry, with the, with the same numerical model that we validated with the, uh, not not uh, yeah, not correctly scaled uh, resistance. We could also say something about the full scale uh, model. So this was a nice combined uh, way to look at model uh, at, at um, transmission with a, a physical model and a numerical model. And another nice thing that where the people were thinking about was uh, uh, coral reefs. So these are very shallow water, long waves that travel over these corals, and they used. Uh, uh, a, a machine that we're using more and more, a 3D printer to make the molds for all these uh, hundreds of coral pieces they, they would. And uh, that's also, uh, it's Paul van Wiege, a nice research that's referred to later. Um, so, and then uh, the strength and elasticity, we go to more, uh, more difficult and more difficult things to scale. Uh, so sometimes our structure is moving. And then we can see here trees that have branches that are not uh, very rigid. So then the, they are deforming by the, by the waves. So this is this uh, research where the wave damping is influenced also by the rigidity. And we know that from, that's another dimension number, the Cauchy number, that if we make something smaller, uh, then the, the stresses become smaller, but the material stays the same. So we, the, uh, the effective, so the, sorry, the forces, the effective stresses, they become uh, less. So the, 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 things that we look at become more rigid and they become more strong if we use the same materials. So actually the elasticity should be scaled if we want this bending to be correct. And here with the 3D printing, they selected a plastic that nicely scaled the, the, the rigidity of these branches. So we had this, um, actually this test was also done at full scale in the Delta flume. So this is a real scale model, not of a breakwater, but of a wave breaking forest. And each tree was uh, individually scaled. So this was a really, uh, we are analyzing this, uh, this now, whether we have the scale effects. Another project that is for related to, to the Asladijk, at least the principles. So here we have impacts on this overhanging structure. You can see waves hitting the thing, but this plate, this is the floodgate. You can see from the behind that they are, it's vibrating. So with every wave impact, you can see this vibration. And there's a lot of sensors to, Look at this modal response of this, these floodgates also to the wave impact. So here we can see that for the really detailed wave structure interaction, you also need to look at the elasticity. And these are typically not tests that are done. Uh, this is really more research because I didn't see many consultancy jobs uh, looking at elasticity. Well, in mooring lines for something that is um, then only the mooring line, sometimes the elasticity is scaled. So that sometimes uh, that is done. Um, yeah, rocking. Um, so here we see something, a problem with strength, but this is full scale. So we see the, the proud Dutch uh, armor unit, the X-block, and we can see that it when it can break if you don't place it correctly or a wave comes. But also the French, or this is the American box, sometimes if you place them, they can break. Or the French blocks, Two types they can all break so the concrete strength it's 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 a issue it is not salt and well in the end we are just looking how often a a block uh, moves or vibrates uh, and it should not be too much but actually we're never measuring this strength 
And measuring the strength, uh, that's too difficult because yeah, there, there's these whole units. But what we could do is measure the impact velocity. Uh, and that's what we did on this block, uh, this slope of uh, X block units. Uh, and we made this machine. So we have a 3D printed X block. Uh, and uh, this magnet is removed and then it starts measuring all its motions. And to check whether it was working, we, um, after this was measured, we um, plotted the block again and then we imposed the, me the measured velocities. So then you get this. So you can see that if down on the left, he moves the block, then you, on the right side, you can see that the measurement uh, uh, exit. So it's it's actually, we are, are able now with a 100 Hertz to measure all the motions in the block. So actually these are the sensors that are also in your uh, in your iPhone. And so the, the nine axis inertial measurement units. Uh, and then, yeah, this when you have this completely standalone uh, computer, so there was an X block with a watertight USB connection. So then here, the, the white ones are the uh, instrumented X blocks, and then you make the whole uh, slope, and you fill it with water. And then we'll see from the top what happens to the slope when it's, it's, uh, when it's loaded with the wave. So here we can see that the, sometimes you can see a single element rocking. Well, let's see this one, for instance, this one is rocking. But you can also see that the whole slope is going down. So uh, we think that in due time that the rocking motion is going down a little bit. And we're now still uh, analyzing all these results. What we get a very nice, so for 10 units, we have this, this rocking motion now measured. So that's really cool. Uh, but we also see this, this motion. Huh? So um, let me go here. Yeah, no. Yeah. So at present, if we look at this armor slope of single layer armor units, and we look after a test, we say, wow, no, no, no one has been re replaced, so nothing happens. And then if one is lifted out of the layer, then we call it failure. So it, there is no in-between thing. But you can see a lot is moving. Right? So this is before and after test. We see that all the, the, the voids are opening up, and these waves are really impacting this round head of this breakwater. Uh, and if you use these two pictures before and after, I wrote this paper once, then you can just use co correlation techniques, and you can actually very easily quantify the, the direction of the, of, the, of the settlement of these armor units. And you can see, uh, so if um, a lot of armor units are going down here, then probably here the voids will have opened. So I have a, a weaker structure. So it is actually just based on two images, very possible to say something about the state of your structure before you get this dislocation, which we typically already regard as failure immediately. So these two techniques, we are hoping to, to use this together with this rocking motion sensor to look what happens to the, um, uh, these these uh, classic uh, single layer armor units. Then, yeah, sometimes we're also looking at scour, although, uh, so here we can see a breakwater tow, a bed protection, waves coming, and here on the left you see that the scour hole is developing. Uh, and typically, the time scale of sediment transport doesn't scale well, uh, but the scour magnitude we still trust, also because we don't have any very much uh, different uh, so here in this study, we were looking whether, uh, so how long the bed protection should be to, to influence the scour. And the scour is formed by the, the node and anti-node pattern that is in front of this breakwater. And we had some very nice results on this, but I don't think I have time to go uh, into this, but this is also something we do. Uh, this I will skip completely, although it's very nice. Um, but I do want to show this one. Uh, so. Velocities we sometimes measure, and actually velocities uh, for a breakwater test, for instance, hey, we always measure the waves coming in and the damage that occurs. So we never measure the velocity, but for wave impacts like this study, we typically do want to know a velocity. Uh, and actually velocities are the most difficult to measure because they are uh, they everywhere in the domain in three directions, they are different. And then uh, they are also acting in, it's a vector with, with three dimensions. Um, and it's also yeah, changing in time, of course, and it's very difficult to assess because yeah, you do not want to disturb the, the, the flow. So the laser Doppler is it with, with lasers can uh, really have a non-intrusive test and particle image velocity is also nice where we look with a camera on a lot of dirt in, in the water. And here, this is an example of this PIV measurement. So we, we developed our own LED light so that we can illuminate not with a laser, but with LED light. So it's more safe for the eye. And it's also a bigger domain. We can, in this case, we had 35 centimeter of image. And this is this uh, impact on, under this, this overhang that we saw before. 
and we can measure really nicely the, the velocities of the impact uh, underneath this, this structure. So here, boom, then the velocity stops after the impact. So it is possible to do this, but this typically is uh, it's, uh, it's a lot more work than, uh, so, so this is actually for only for the measurement, you need one master student of eight months to, to do the measurements. It is uh, not something you just plug in and, and, and play it. Well, then we have pressures and forces and Alessandro uh, showed you yesterday is some uh, well, overtopping results, but of course you also need to measure the pressures and the forces where the pressures are, uh, give you a very high frequency. Uh, they give you a low resolution. So you always, actually you typically want to use both uh, techniques all the time and they both have their drawbacks. Um, I'm not going to go into all the wave signals. Well, the, this is actually quite fairly well known. Uh, two more, two more pictures. Uh, I think that they are important. So one is active reflection comp compensation. So this is a very nice movie from uh, Del Tires. Do you see the movie now? I clicked on a link. Oh, then I cannot show it. Sorry for that. Uh, then I will keep the link in the in the presentation. I will share, and you can look at it later. Uh, let me go back to my own. Uh... But of course, if you're making with your wave pedal waves, they travel towards your structure, then they reflect, they go back to your wave pedal. And if you do nothing, then they will again re-reflect -re from your wave pedal. So you have more energy sending out than you expect. So uh, at, the, in, at the end, you get uh, rubbish uh, wave spectra here. So you want to reduce this re reflected wave energy. And typically you want active composition that really measures the incoming wave and absorbs it by altering its motion. And those are, that's what uh, makes a wave plume very uh, high tech. And that's also the difficult system you want to, uh, 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 so that, that, that makes it much, easy, much more difficult to make and to maintain. But uh, so we had uh, yeah, the last slide on the wave generation, then I'm almost finished. I'm taking a bit too much time. So, but we have all these higher order wave theories. We having the reflection compensation on our pedals. So we make the perfect wave field here. So this is uh, the, the wave pedal. But then if we look at, this, at, at a breakwater, so the breakwater is at a very uh, shallow depth often. Huh? So for the, the storm waves, the breakwater, it's, 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 it's shallow water. Uh, and we can only make these waves at three to four times uh, the water depth. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the water depth is three to four times the wave height. And then we can use all these higher order theories and the reflection compensation. So then everything works here. But we, because we want to have the realistic wave transformation, we mimic the, the bathymetry of the seabed in front of our breakwater. So that is correct. So this is completely correct. And this is completely correct. But in between, we have this transition slope. And there we just put something. So actually, what happens for the cool waves here and the waves there, that is actually unknown. So this is the open question at this moment. What happens exactly with, with these nicely generated waves? Maybe I get again spurious waves here at, at our transition. So uh, actually, there is, uh, is some more research to be done. That so now we are practically looking at we are just measuring the uh, the waves at this location and and and, and tuning the, the 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 spectrum or the at least the wave height and the, so that we have the correct uh, uh, integral parameters here. But of course, it would much be much nicer if we put our put our wave pedal directly at the uh, at the depth that we want it, because then we don't have this disturbance of our wave field that we cannot have any control over. So that is uh, also future research that we want to do. Uh, in three D, of course, you have also some re other reflections to take into account. So you need more damping uh, around it, passive damping and, and, and guidance of, of waves. So that was uh, everything I wanted to say on uh, modeling. So I left out a little part on the on the on the wave generation, but that is uh, for next time. Uh, and I hope I showed that there are still a lot of things that we are trying to improve uh, to go more in depth, and especially to, to use all kinds of new sensors to get more velocities and pressures and um, deformations out of our structures. Also to see things that we did not see before. Uh, so here are the, some classic handbooks that, uh, of course, you can use and uh, something on the wave analysis. And I showed a lot of uh, research that we've been doing on these modeling techniques, and uh, I've got them with uh, links. Well, they are all open, I think, uh, except this one. I couldn't find it. So you can um, uh, access those. 
Uh, and that's uh, so uh, before I say thank you for attention, I have one last thing to say. Um, and that is, uh, so we think that structures are quite cool, coastal structures. So in the middle, we can see this, this uh, mass flux that I will be talking about tomorrow, the protection of the port of Rotterdam, but also a German uh, structure. And this is a Korean structure, I think this is spillway. So, and there is not a, re there was not a real journal on the, the structural part really. Huh? So only the, the, the structure. So we thought let's start a journal of coastal and hydraulic structures. So since January this year, we have this high level engineering science um, uh, journal started. And of course we also want to, uh, so it has a focus on all kinds of hydraulics uh, and fluid structure interaction. So really the small scale of fluid structure interaction as I showed a lot of things, uh, examples before. Um, and it's completely free. So there's no uh, processing charges or submission charges also free to read. Uh, and that was of course uh, some drawback of existing journals. Uh, and of course they, you, they are also uh, open access the papers. We have a, a large international editorial board, uh, double blind reviews, which is also nice. So uh, no, the reviewers do not know who they are reviewing a, a, a journal from, uh, a paper from. Um, and we actually also want to involve industry and government because often they are also doing very large work, especially on the structures and it doesn't reach back to the academia. So we want also to connect these um, uh, various parties. And it's, it's uh, hosted by the TU Delft. They have a publishing uh, company that really hosts these things. So uh, go to the website. The first six papers are we expect to have around 15 papers this year. But of course, we want to grow and want to have very many nice uh, papers. So um, uh, it is open for submissions. I, I wanted to share this with you. And it's also linking to the topic that we're discussing, of course, this week. OK, and with that, I am finished. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bas, for, for your presentation. Quite a lot of information to, to process in in an hour so uh, thanks for that uh, so no uh, i kept my mind quite engaged uh, during the whole presentation so uh, it was really really nice uh, and it's great that you you have started this new journal i was writing down and making some notes just to share with a few colleagues here so uh, that's that's very nice uh, raul perhaps you you want to mention something or to or of course, all questions from the audience are more than welcome. Please write it down in the chat uh, so we can discuss with Buzz. But he was already addressing many of them during the, uh, the presentation. Excellent presentation, Buzz. Congratulations. And uh, I, it was a very a nice picture, the first one, when you show the, the open basin at the worst, the old laboratory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's really nice. It, it, it was a, quite a challenge to work there when you have wind. <laughs> yeah. In, in the open. So you have yeah, I, a... So you, you work there? Uh, six months. Oh, cool, very nice. Yeah. yeah, that was a very nice location. I could only work at the Delta Flume. The Delta Flume was there until uh, six years ago. So then uh, I could still do some tests there. And also there, the wind was a problem. And uh, I used to live in a, in a very big city in the surroundings that is Krachenburg. <laughs> <laughs> Good pronunciation. pronunciation. Okay. Um, there's... Yeah. Uh, it would be very interesting to have a copy of your presentation, Bas. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I will uh, keep all the links. So, uh... Okay. Yeah, the, the, that's great. Then, of course, uh, we will prepare a, a round or, or an email with all the presentations of, of the courses and also with, with the adapted video or recorded videos to, to be posted online. So, and then we will share that with all the participants. That's to, to keep uh, in mind. 
there's one question was coming from Amin um, on the on the chat. Uh, perhaps, yeah, yeah, you you would like to to address directly the question as you were doing, or yes. we can call. Um, yeah, okay. uh, I didn't read it yet. Um... Okay, it's about the step. Yeah, um, I will go back to the picture. I think I have to share again. Where is that here? It's not too far back, I think. Yeah. So, um, so actually, this is not a this this that's the problem. This step is not a. Uh, natural thing so actually from this point on so so where the cursor is now here we start to mimic the real seabed that we expect so and it's fixed bed so it is not even a sandbar so but sandbars are typically more in a in a surf zone so it's rather deep water and then we get the breakwater so it is also rather a stable depth um but the problem is that the the bathymetry here that we the, the from there to there that we want to mimic that is the real seabed uh but here it's still too shallow and, and after five wavelengths, we think we have made enough. It's expensive enough. Uh, so we have to go back to the depth where we can make the waves because this is still too shallow. And that's where we say, well, we'll just put a one in 10 slope there. So this is a completely artificial slope. You could also put a one in 30 slope there and one in three slope, uh, whatever. But it's not there. In reality, the, the foreshore goes down much more shallow here. So this transition, it can, it can alter your waves 